Hello, and welcome to Fresh Blood, a podcast about killing it in the age of ageism, where we prove that new blood does not necessarily equal young blood. Here to discuss what it takes to have continued success through life, I'll be your host, Jolie Downs. With over 20 years of executive recruiting experience, I've learned how much we can grow and be inspired by other people's stories. I'm excited to share that with you here on Fresh Blood. Today, we are talking with Corby Mitlide. Corby is a psychic channel and medium doing reading since 1973. She has held various jobs throughout her career, actress, inspirational speaker, legal assistant, video producer, even executive recruiter, before focusing on her psychic work full-time in her late 40s. She has since been thriving in her work, traveling coast to coast as a full-time intuitive counselor, appearing on radio and television, and she is an inspirational teacher and facilitator. Corby is not only the featured channel in Robert Schwartz's breakthrough series, Your Soul's Plan and Your Soul's Gift, but she is also an accomplished author of three books, Clean Out Your Life Closet, The Psychic Yellow Brick Road, and You've Got the Magic, Who Needs a Genie? Corby, thank you so much for joining us on Fresh Blood. Please tell us a little bit more about your story. All right. I call this my 30-second elevator pitch. When I was nine, I read a book called The Witch Family by Eleanor Estes. And instead of thinking, ooh, that's scary or ha, 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 I thought, and your point is, I knew there was magic in the world. I wanted it. Fast forward to 1973, when I was a senior in high school, working part-time at Spencer Gifts, and they had the James Bond 007 tarot deck, and I bought it. I mean, we were all hippies then. You had your elf bells, the fringe jacket, and you needed a deck. Five years later, everybody else had moved on to disco balls and roller skates. I was still reading because I loved the allegory. I loved the story. I loved being able to give people ideas of how to move forward. 20 years After just reading for friends, all of a sudden I could do hands-on healing and talk to dead people with no training. That's kind of when the universe handed me my draft notice and said, hello, you're working for me. So I did this part-time while I was an actress and author and inspirational speaker, writer of graphic novels, legal assistant, video producer, headhunter. (laughs) I didn't check her career, baby. But on 9-11, my husband and I watched the towers burn. I was... 46? No. Yeah. Yeah. 46, I think. Um, And I looked at him and I said, I'm going to need to do this work full time. People need to know there are other answers out there. He said, I believe we'll go do it. So for one year, I did the strat, what I call the straddle. I was working 70 hours a week as an executive recruiter for a woman who threw files at my head when she didn't like what I told her and doing the psychic work evenings and weekends to make sure that I could do this and make a living at it. One year later, you know, it was goodbye and I've never looked back and I'm 65. That's great. And that's a great way to do it too. You didn't have to quit your day job to go after your dreams and you waited until you were able to let your dream fulfill, fulfill the financial aspect at least. Yes, very much. Yes, that's fantastic. Now, what you, you mentioned that you were doing readings, and then you fast forward, and you had these other these other gifts. Did did anything happen to you? Were you these gifts came along, or were they just something that was built in through practice? It wasn't built in through practice. It was built in through living the examined life and getting my own ego tamped down and cleared out. So, what's the examined life? You were never a victim. You look at whatever happens to you and say, okay, this is happening. What do I need to learn from it? Because of my intellectual bent, it's how can I teach with it? So that's why when I decided to do this work, as an executive recruiter, I already knew that at age 50, most times, at least 20 years ago, women were thrown on the dung heap and they would hire young for a third of the cost. So I knew that I wanted to start an entrepreneurial business before that happened to me. And the timing was great. I straddled both mountains. Yes, I do what I cheerfully call the wiki woo, but I also know good business practices. And that, with a lot of hard work, has made me what I call an A-lister. 
the one you always want to go to. If there are 150 booths at a holistic expo, mine is always the one that's busy. So because I understand marketing, I understand social media, I understand networking, I understand the moral and ethical responsibilities to a client, to a customer. And because, and I'm funny. And I use, I, I use that, you know, use every single thing you've got when you're putting together your, the next part of your life. Don't say, well, you know, just because I make uh, coconut macaroons, that doesn't matter. You don't know that. Find a place to put it. Yeah, I love it. And you know, it is incredible how powerful marketing and social media is. And in, in your field, I would imagine so many people maybe aren't applying that to the greatest benefit. No, they're not. Because um, one of the problems with a lot of metaphysical work is that um, people think it's so spiritual, I shouldn't be charging. Yes, you should. Good Lord. When I do a four-day expo in Canada, and I live in, in upstate New York, that's roughly five days of hotel. That's a thousand miles on my car. That's the booth fee, hiring my front person, food. Yeah, you're going to pay me. We all, we all charge for our talent. That's, that's what we do. Yes. Self-respect. Yes. Self-respect. You know, so you've, you've done a lot in the past 20 years. I know you've, you've traveled coast to coast. You've written these books. You're, you're a part of uh, a lot of different aspects within your field. What has been your greatest success and, and what did you learn from it? My greatest success is being able to reach out to people and put a rocket pack on their back. I am not a fortune teller. I do not. I am not the kind of fake gypsy that goes, oh, you have a family curse. How many in your family? Four, you have dog. Fifty dollars every family member. Twenty five for dog. He's small. We fix. Oh, please. That's what I warn people against. So, so what, what are you more like then? Um. I'm like, you sit with your, your best friend who is from New York and I will whack you upside the head with a clue brick. When, if you came to me and said, I'm starting a new business, there are a lot of psychics who would flip a couple of cards and go, I am getting that you should wait until March and fire the second redhead. What does that tell you? Me, a card for you, a card for the energy around the business, a card for your brick and mortar location, how to market it, clients, competition, staff, finances, what you need to know and best possible outcome. There, you have all of that information. And I teach my clients, don't ask me yes or no, will my business be successful? What if I say no, you're going to live, lose everything and live in a box under a bridge? Wrong question. You ask, how can I make it rock? How can I get it to take off? You always ask the empowering questions. And that's the most important thing I do for people. I'm not magic. I just have a way of giving you the extra information maybe you didn't have your hands on. Mm -hmm. Oh, and asking the right questions. You're so right. And so often we don't know what those right questions are. I know. I know. That's why I wrote my books. I love I it. I don't care if you don't come to me after you read the books. Any psychic that you go to, if you know that information, you're going to get a better experience. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So so your most recent book, what was what was that covering? You've got The Magic Who Needs a Genie is how to be an A-lister at Holistic Expos, but it's really good marketing for anybody in a slightly left of center business. Because I'm 65, darling. I would like to come off the road. 45 weekends a year. Yes, my nickname is the Travel Channel, but I'm tired. <laughs> and, you know, this year with, you know, Murder Hornet bingo, uh, we're not on the road and a lot of the, the expos were canceled. But that brings you back to the examined life. Shows started changing and a lot of promoters leaving the business within the past two years. So instead of panicking, I said, all right, how can I morph my business? So 95% of what I do is online Zoom and Skype. So when the big bug adventure closed everything down, didn't affect me at all. Amazing. That's So did you have all this in place before the shutdown or did you? Yes. Yes. You that's the thing. That's also part of looking at what's the next thing. You know, Rob's books are international bestsellers. Somebody from Bolivia does not want to come up here to Schoharie County and the sheep and the cows to have a reading with me. So I had better know how to do Skype and Zoom. Um, classes, I love classes, I love lecturing. You can do that on Zoom. 
And so when I am that available to that many people, it opens up my client base from local or regional to international. Oh, that's great. When did you go online? How long ago? Well, my uh, website, uh, Fire Through Spirit, which is now CorbyMidlight.com, that was in 2000. I was one of the the first ones out there. Um, The current iteration has been up for five years. That's fantastic. So let's flip the question. What about a time that you had to deal with an obstacle, a struggle, a mistake, or you failed? How did you deal with it and, and what did you learn from it? You have to learn. Um, If we're talking about the psychic business, there was um, a situation where a woman decided that she didn't like my reading. She didn't like me. And she proceeded to uh, trash me online everywhere and anywhere she could. Ooh. Ooh, how did you deal with that? Well, for one thing, I made sure that I found these things and I would put a response. And I also got Oh, about three dozen of my clients to make sure that they put testimonials out there about how good I was. And within six months, you know, she doesn't exist. The other thing is, if you go and you look at, say, on Google, you look at my reviews, I've got 70 now, maybe, you'll notice that not every one of them is five star. I have a couple that are one, two, and three star. And that's actually a good thing because it makes me look real. I'm not going to be everybody's favorite flavor of, of psychic. I'm not. No one living will be. Well, right. So the fact that I do have a couple of marginal to she stinks up there means that people will take the rest of the testimonials as real ones. Yes. Well, and, it, and, and it's great that you can you can take that view, viewpoint with it as well mm-hmm. and, and be comfortable in your own skin and know that the value you bring to your clients. I read 1,200 people a year. If I was as lousy as that woman <laughs> said, no. <laughs> That is a lot of people. That is a lot of people. And do you get most of your business through online, would you say now? Um, Now I do. It was a combination of uh, constantly on the road. Uh, I do once a month free readings on Facebook. Those are always useful. I have a YouTube channel. It's Instagram. Um, I've been in Rob's books now for uh, 15 years. So my rep's out there that way. That's great. You can so, make it happen online. You can. That's amazing. I, I I love what you've been doing. Are there specific habits that have helped you create the success in your field? Yep. I get to get up every morning. I don't have to get up every morning. Oh, I love that. Um, Corby Mitlide is, if you will, my entertainer's name. It's my Elton John. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have a legal name, like he was Reginald Dwight. But Corby... For one, Corby is Gaelic for ravens. They're my baby birds. Ravens are beautiful, magnificent, and have lots of magic in their uh, literary background. And mitleid is a German word that means compassion. It reminds me why I do the work. I am not here to show you that my aura don't stink. I'm here in service. And as long as I remember that, there is joy in the work. Oh, isn't that true? Oh, I love that. And it's so true. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I'm curious because there are a lot of people who claim to be psychic but aren't. And, you know, so uh, people sometimes get a little nervous about if they should go see someone. Are there any tips on how to know if a psychic is authentic? Well, let me tell you about the second book. Um, (laughs) Seriously, uh, my second book is called The Psychic Yellow Brick Road, How to Find the Real Wizards and Avoid the Flying Monkeys. And this is Everything that I learned from 15 years on the road, it teaches you how to um, do your testimonial back checks. It teaches you how to ask the right questions. It tells you when you should get up and walk away. Uh, It warns you against things like drive-by psychic shootings, um, which is one of my big hot buttons. I know we've all seen the Long Island medium walk up to somebody in the frozen pizzas and go, I have a message from your Aunt Doris. Your back tire on the right side, it's bald. You're going to die in a car accident in two weeks. You don't get it fixed. Just telling you. And she walks away. Who the hell is she? And get out of my face. That's a drive-by psychic shooting. People do not, when that happens, they assume that when they walk by us, we're invading their brains like, you know, the body snatchers. No. For one thing, That's not how a reality show works. They had to get permission. They had to film it several times. No, it doesn't happen that way, guys. 
And what I tell people is if somebody walks up to you and says, I have a message for you, you have permission to say, I don't give you permission to tell me. And if they keep following you, you report them, you're being harassed. Even the spiritualists at Lilydale, which is one of the most famous spiritualist communities in the world, if they have a message for you, they come to you and they say, I have a message. May I come to you? And if you say no, that's it. You really do control your session with a psychic. If you don't want us to talk about health things with us, with you, tell us, you know, um, don't, don't be afraid that we're going to commandeer your life. We're not interested. What do you think some of the misconceptions people have about going to the psychic are? Because I'm sure there are many. Oi. Uh, <laughs> the, one of my favorites is um, that you're allowed to test the psychic. There have been times when people have stood in front of me at my booth at an expo and said, well, why don't you tell me something that you couldn't know about me? And if you're right, uh, yeah, I'll have a reading with you. And I look at them and I smile and say, I'm sorry, I don't roll over and fetch either. And I turn my back and they don't get a reading. We are not trick ponies. Um, and the other thing that, that drives me crazy is the people that always think they can convince you you don't really need to charge what you're charging. So the usual things are, well, why don't you just read me for a discount? You're not reading anything right now. So, you know, you'll make some money. Or um, can my friend and I sit and have a reading, but we only pay for one of us? Or, you know, why don't you read me free a couple times? And if you're really good, um, I'll tell people about you. Or... I'd really like a reading, but I can't afford it. And they stand and they stare at you waiting. And my favorite, you're not going to read me for free. You're not very spiritual, are you? How do you react to them? I just say to them, okay, we're going to um, flip the situations. You say to the hairdresser, why don't you cut my hair for half price? You don't have an appointment right now. You say to the plumber, why don't you put in my dishwasher and fix my bathroom sink and I'll only pay you for one service call and on and on. And my favorite, you say to a doctor, why won't you cure me for free? You're awful. You want me to die. And when they hear this, they realize just how stupid they sound. Yes. I love that response. It's a spot on. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. And you've got to, you've got to value your worth because no one else is if you don't. That's right. You, you know, I would imagine the start of this process was a little bit of a struggle. I mean, did you, did you find that you had to overcome a lot of um, bias or, or things of that nature or was it fairly easy for you? Well, there's a reason I'm a reverend. One of them is before there was same gender marriage, if buddies of mine who batted for the same team wanted sacred ceremony, wanted to give it to them. And the other was when you crossed south of the Mason-Dixon line, there were some times when they said, you're a fortune teller, ma'am, and that's against the law. And I'd say, no, but Reverend, it's pastoral counseling. And they went, oh, that's all right, Reverend, we're so sorry. So, <laughs> you know, you got to realize that's going to be out there. To this day, there are people in my family who will not admit to what I do. They call me a motivational speaker. Mm. Oh, how, and how, and how do you deal with that? Because that's really interesting. I, they don't have to believe what I do. I have enough clients who do. Um, there's one member of my family I know doesn't believe it because they cannot talk to my father and I can. Uh, dad was a brilliant cardiologist, love him to bits. And I know from nothing about medicine, but if I do a medical intuitive, he, especially if it's cardiac related, he'll come in. There was a woman, she was a nurse. She said, would you just do a check on me? And I feel the rustle of a coat behind me. And I point to the empty air. And I say, I'd like to introduce you to my father, Dr. Jerome Dorkin. He was a crack cardiologist when he's alive, still does consults. And all of a sudden, what came into my mind was, uh, he wants to know what's with the T waves. And she looks at me. She had abnormal T waves on her last EKG. Now, what did my father do as director of the heart station at Cooper Hospital for 30 years? Read EKGs. And I just look over my shoulder and I say, you know, you're still a pretty darn good doctor, even if you aren't dead. He laughs. Um, so if they don't choose to believe, I can't make them. When we're dead, we'll find out which one of us is right or wrong. But for now, I'm proud of what I do. I help people. I love it. You know, you let go of what other people's opinions are. It doesn't matter. Oh, my two favorite phrases, take them and run with them. Thank you for sharing. You may think that if you wish, and then you go do what the heck you want to do. I completely agree. I've been sharing that with my teenager recently. Good. 
<laughs> so, so let me ask you, I mean, you obviously have had a lot of success within your career here. So what do you believe is key to continued success in your life? couple of things. Remembering, number one, I'm just the tool, the tube, the information comes through. It ain't me. Number two, I am in service. Um, I can't believe that this is all me and God, I'm so wonderful. And as long as I still have joy sharing what I do, one of the things people say to me, which is bizarre to me, is, I mean, when I find the rookies, the ones who are just starting in the work and there it's the first time at a, a, at an expo, I'll take them over to my booth. I'll show them what I do. I'll give them copies of, of, you know, my flyers and everything. I say, look at these, you know, don't copy the wording, but always ask me questions. I'm happy to share. And they say, everybody is so concentrated on me first. Nobody shares like you do. I say, it's because I know I'm good and I know I'm different. When you know what you're good at, you will relax into that and you will be able to share. For instance, there are people who are probably a lot better at being a medium than I am. The late, great Allie Cheswick in New York. Oh my God, she was amazing. My skills are tarot. I'm a certified professional tarot reader and a past life person. Now, my understanding, my belief, the universe knows what we've got and they use it. My background. I'm an actress. I'm a writer and a storyteller. And my husband was a prof- is a professional historian. And we met at the uh, Rhinebeck Aerodrome in Rhinebeck, New York. And as he says, there was this gorgeous brunette who knew the difference between a Fokker DR1 and an F1 based on the wing skids. I had to marry her. So when someone comes to somebody else and they say, well, I'm seeing you in long dress and a big hat. So I think it's old fashioned. I can say, okay, hobble skirt, picture hat, that kind of ostrich feather where you're probably talking 1910 or 11 in Berlin, which one's going to give you more information. On the other hand, there are people who do psychometry and pendulum work really, really well. I have a benign tremor in my hand. I can't trust the pendulum. I don't do that. There is room for all of us. We've all got our specialty. And what I would say to the people listening, whether you are a psychic or a chef, or a dog groomer, or a physicist. Find what you are best at and love it. Love it into existence. Love it into existence. I love that. And you absolutely did that for yourself. Mm -hmm. I did. I have such a good time with my clients. I really do. It frankly, it's one of the reasons I stopped acting because I wanted to say my words on stage, not somebody else's. Oh, isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. You know, what advice would you give someone who might be struggling in this time and place in their life? I mean, perhaps in the second half of life and they're not quite sure what the right next step is, or they're having just trouble finding the right next step. There are two things about that. Number one, very often women do not know what they want at that age. And it's because it's basically been emotionally beaten out of us. Example. Where two, there's this white thing with silver things and we reach for it and our mom slaps our hand and says, bad, hot. Where four, there's a plate of cookies. Or a smart four-year-old. We know there's more cookie in the big one than the little one. And so we reach for it and our hand gets slapped. Bad, you're selfish. So you're not even going to get a cookie. I'm going to give it to your little brother who eats it at you. And she compounds it with, besides, girls who eat cookies get fat. Nobody likes a fat girl. Do you really want to eat that cookie? To the point where by five, We are conditioned that if we want anything, we're wrong, we're bad, we'll be punished, and somebody else will get it and we'll have to watch. That's how our generation was raised. So what I try to work with with women is to say, find your sentence of passion. Your sentence of passion is not who you are or what you do or even how you do it. It's your vapor trail. When you go skidding into heaven on bald tires and fumes in the tank and God hands you a beer and says, so, you get to go, I did this. Isn't it cool? And for me, that sentence is cross the bridge from fear to fearlessness and fly. When I can take somebody from point A to point B when they thought they couldn't make it, whack them on their shoulder and say, here are your wings. You don't need a flight plan. Now get, 
I'm living my bliss. And I have done it as the actress, the author, the inspirational speaker. Everything I've done has always been to pull people across bridges they thought they couldn't cross, but they wanted to. Oh God, that's so beautiful. I want to get up and cheer everything you just said. It was perfect. It was perfect. Is there anything that you feel is left unfinished for yourself? More books. More books. I would love a reality show. I mean, you know, sure, there's lots of stuff. I'm 65. I figure I've got until I'm 80. So I got to like push a little bit. Yeah. And that's what I want to hear that you have a full list of things. That's the best. You know, I'm curious before we back up, wrap up. I mean, what brought about your first book? What, what, what may inside of you decided that you were going to go about this? And then also, how did you make that happen? Okay. The first book is called Clean Out Your Life Closet. It's the first of a trilogy planned, Clean Out Your Life Closet, The Big Reboot, and Be Your Own Masterpiece. But there's not one of us, you, me, the listeners, who don't have self-help books on our shelves that we haven't read because it has a sexy title and a gorgeous cover. We flip a few pages in Barnes and Noble and it looks good. And then we get it home and find out that she wants us to live as vegans and do yoga four times a month and go work at a soup kitchen. I'm sorry, but no, um, I'm a software engineer with three kids and I live in Milwaukee. It's not going to happen. So what I did is I said, I'm going to trust my readers. Here's the stupid stuff that I did. Here are a couple of client examples, and here's some thoughts. But at the end of each chapter, there are what I call the adventure pages. And the thing about the adventure pages is there are questions that are open-ended. There are no right answers. For instance, in the chapter, Finding Happiness with What You Have Right Now, how good are you at finding happiness in the moment? If you aren't good, what do you think stops you? There is no right answer. There's your answer. So by the end of reading this book, Four parts are clarity, adaptability, simplicity, and making friends with stress. This is your personal manual. And even if your best buddy bought the same book at the same time and did her questions at the end of each chapter, you would have two different personal manuals. It's very powerful. It's very powerful. And how did you get this published? Oh, I did self. I did self. Um, I found a brilliant, brilliant editor. Her name is Bernie Jung. And uh, there's a great group called the Troy Bookmakers here in Troy, New York, that do a great job of publishing it. And so I got a thousand copies and I took it to shows and I sent it out to reviewers and um, we put it on Kindle. And for this one, I also did a, a Kickstarter so I could do an audio book because to me, number one, you know, I've done voiceovers. And the other is a nonfiction book should be read by the person who wrote it because they're the ones who have the passion behind it. I agree. Oh, I love that. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing your story, Corby. I loved everything you had to say. There were so many great takeaways. I had a great time. Thank you for asking me. Corby left us with many great takeaways. First, she started our conversation immediately with her elevator pitch. Everyone should have an elevator pitch. If you don't know what this is, it's a quick recap of your background and experience. It's called an elevator pitch because it should be short enough to present during a brief elevator ride. The elevator pitch is perfect for networking, conferences, and job interviews. Use this pitch to share your skills in a brief yet persuasive way. Corby's story teaches us that we can change our course at any time in life. She was 46 years old when she decided to embrace a new path and develop her psychic business full-time. When she made the decision, she did not quit her day job. She kept at what was paying her bills, but in her spare time, she went after her passion and built a practice on the side. It took her only one year to build that side business up enough to be able to quit and focus in on full time. Has there been something that's been interesting to you? Is there a thought that keeps popping up or an idea that that is intriguing? You, You don't have to drastically change your life to go after your goals. Start taking one step every day towards the goals you have outside of work or within work 
and, and watch your opportunities grow. Imagine who you can be in a year if, if you just get that 1% better each day, if you just gain that one win each day. Now, Corby's practice grew because she stayed moral, she stayed ethical, and she stayed authentic. By staying true to herself and who she was, she attracted the right clientele for her. And then by staying moral and ethical, she grew a loyal and satisfied following that continues with her today. We can all use more moral and ethical people in business and in the world. She also utilized marketing, social media, and networking to bring a new business to her psychic practice. Almost every business can benefit from smart marketing, PR, and social media. As a recruiter in the communications industry for over 20 years now, I can attest to the absolute stunning power of PR and marketing. People, you have no idea the decisions you've made through the years because of a few people's smart marketing and communications plan. Stop being only the pawn and make sure you're also the player. Pick up the ball on your communications plans. There are tons of great agencies and freelancers out there waiting to help you take your game to the next level. If you can't afford to pay for help, perhaps look into your local college and see if there are any students willing to help you for a successful case study. Corby also reminds us that regardless of the type of work you do, you must have self-respect for what you bring to the table. Value your worth and stay strong in what you charge. If you don't value what you do, how can you expect others to? You must be able to take care of yourself so that you can continue to take care of others. Corby talked about living the empowered life. She believes that we are never victims and we should avoid the victim mindset. She looks at struggles in life and asks herself, what do I need to be learning from what is happening to me? And then she lets herself learn and grow from the situation. In every situation, she has asked asked herself the right questions. She asks herself the empowering questions. She learned that asking yourself these right kind of questions can give you direction and change your focus in an instant. By thinking in terms of possibilities, you help shape the quality of your life. For Corby, when things changed in the industry, she did not panic. She looked at the changes. She stayed aware of what the next big thing is, and she kept herself on the forefront. She even mentioned her website's current iteration, pointing to the fact that she is making sure everything is staying updated. Very important in this day and age. I see many company websites that look like they were put up 20 years ago and never touched. If you haven't updated your company profile or your personal brand in, in, in decades, it might be time to think about a refresh. She had great practical advice for online businesses. She stays aware of the complaints and she makes sure that she responds. She, she asks her satisfied customers to use their own voices and leave reviews. And, and in the mix of it, she recognizes that she isn't everyone's favorite flavor of ice cream. And that is okay because you know what? None of us ever will be. You just need to be comfortable in your own skin, know your own value, show up in service and your audience will find you. She reminds us that you don't have to have everyone believing in you in order for you to do what it is that you want to do. You must follow your own path. Not everyone will understand, and that's okay. What is most important is what you understand. Know what you're good at. Know your strengths. And then relax into them. When you know your value, when you feel that power in your value, you are able to share that value with others. I love that Corby reminded us that there is room for everyone. People, there is so much abundance in this world. There is no need to be greedy There is only need to be open and need to share. 
Corby touched on an important topic among women, and, and she outlined a very real problem that many women face because of how we've been brought up. For so many, they don't know what they want. And this isn't just women either. But so many women have been taught to put others first. And there are countless people who are living life that way every day. If this sounds familiar, like this is you living your life for others, take Corby's lead and find your passion. Dig out from under everyone else's wants and needs and get back in touch with your own. Do you know what you really want? A lot of people aren't sure. And if that's you, perhaps it's time to do a deep dive into what your personal goals are. Start using those open-ended questions that Corby mentioned. Questions like, if you knew you couldn't fail, what would you do? If you could have everything go perfectly over the next few years, exactly as you wanted it to, what would your life look like? What is it that you haven't done that you need to do before you leave this life? I don't care how old you are. If you're in your 40s, 50s, 70s, 90s, spend time figuring out what you want the rest of your life to look like. Spend time thinking about your goals, your goals around career, family, personal, health, finance, relationships. Create goals around every aspect of life and then take little steps towards those goals each and every day. We should be taking stock and reevaluating our wants at various stages through life, not just once. If, if you find you've been reacting to life rather than proactively working towards your own wants and goals, it is time for that deep dive into who you are and who you want to be. Spend time this week thinking about what you want your life to look like in the next few years. Take Corby's advice. Figure out what you want. Don't be afraid to tell everyone what that is. And then cross that bridge from fear into fearlessness and fly. Help create that life where you feel that just like Corby, you get to get up in the morning. You don't have to. Build that life that makes you want to jump from your bed ready and excited to start each and every day. That's my wish for you all. Until next time. Thank you for spending time with us on Fresh Blood. If you love this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, or giving us a review. I'm looking forward to connecting with you again on the next episode.